You're going. Hi, everybody. How you doing today? Good, I hope. Hope you're enjoying the dog days of summer. I got a little bit to tell you about the golem of the Jewish people. Um, I've been calling corporations that, and it pretty much seems that's what they are, are golems. From what little I could find on it. But uh, here is a really good book I found that can tell you the most. And it didn't have much in here, but a couple of stories on it. Um, this is their folk folklore, which is pretty much stories they hang, hand down in their generations and things. So that's the best way to learn how people are, is to hear their stories in English and... You can get a good picture of them. Uh, <clears throat> the thing that I started with on here. Introductory note to the Golem of Prague. And I'll read this to you. The mystery of where do we come from? And where do we go? Has always fascinated thinking men. As human control over the forces of nature grew and man became increasingly conscious of his Latin powers. Latin powers? He began to speculate about his own capacity to equal and even to oppose the demi-ergos of creation. There was no great conceptual, conceptual leap from the Prometheus legend in which man, arrogant in his purposeful knowledge, tried to wrest the elemental secret of fire from the gods. To the mechanical man, the ingenious Mazel made in the early 19th century, or to the mechanical heart invented by Carroll and Lindbergh in our day. <clears throat> like all peoples, Jews too were intrigued by the idea of creation. Alien to all tenets of rationalistic Judaism, even sacrilegious in opposing itself to God. Jewish folk folklore nevertheless boasts a number of legends in which man superseded God as creator. An astonishing piece of imp imprudence from the pious but breathtaking in its sheer daring. The golem or homunculus legend in Jewish folklore is very ancient dating back to rabbinic times. In its literal meaning, the word golem means lifeless, shapeless matter into which the one who has discovered the tegragramaton, shir hamforish, or God's ineffable name, can by its mystic means breathe the impulse of life. <clears throat> there is little doubt that the Talmudic speculations about the creation of the first man simulated the growth of the Golem legends. There is the following passage in the Talmud, complete with all implied directives that were avidly taken up by the legendary Golem creators. How was Adam created? In the first hour his dust was collected. In the second his form was created. In <coughs> Excuse me. In the third, he became a shapeless mass, golem. In the fourth, his members were joined. In the fifth, his apertures opened. In the sixth, he received his soul. <clears throat> In the seventh, he stood up on his feet. According to the uh, Agata in the Talmud, the celebrated rabbi, rabbi, Rabbah had created a homo culius. This creature was a man like any other man, except that he lacked the power of speech, which God alone could endow. When in a mood of egotism and vainglory, Rabbah sent his golem to Rabbah Zira, the sage quickly discovered the creature's magical origin and indignantly returned him to the dust from which, which he was fashioned. 
The creation of man was God's own business, he said. And that's true. And because a golem lacks the power of speech, that does make a corporation declared human as a golem because it does not have its own speech. He has other humans speaking for him. There is also the legend in the Talmud about the two rabbis, Hania and Oshaga, every Friday by means of mystic formula from the book of creation. They would make a three-year-old calf which they ate on the Sabbath. The 11th century Bible exorcist Rasha, being thoroughly saturated with Jewish Kabbalah and with the supernaturalism of the medieval Christian world, even tried to give the account a dubious religious sanction. They, Hania and Osa Oshaga, used to combine the letters of the name by which the universe was created. This is not to be considered forbidden magic, for the words of God were brought into being through his holy name. Jewish legend even has that Rashi's great contemporary, the poet philosopher of Valencia, Solomon Ibn Gavadral, create a maid servant golem. When the king heard of it, he wished to put the Jewish poet to death for practicing black magic. But Gabaral demonstrated to the king's royal satisfaction that the creature he made was not human, and forthwith he returned her to dust. Couldn't continue that lie, could he? Another golem was alleged to have been created in the time of the Crusades in France by Rabbi, Rabbi Samuel, the father of the famous Judah Hasid. He fa fashioned a home homoculus but like rabbi in Bible times in Bible times he could not make it talk wherever he went his golem accompanied him as his servant and vigilant bodyguard Christian Europe too had its own versions of the homoculus what else are the medieval legends of Dr. Faustus and the poet, poet Virgil even as Rashi believed in the authenticity of the creation of the rabbinical calf, so did the most advanced Christian thinkers of the Middle Ages and the Renaissance believe in the legend of Virgil's statue unto, into which the poet had breathed life and forced it to obey his will in various escapades. By the time of the late Renaissance legends about golems were widespread among the Jews of Eastern Europe, the most popular folk tale was that of the Golem of Chelm, created by the redoubtable Kabbalist Rabbi Elijah of that town. He allegedly created it sometimes during the middle of the 16th century by the means of the Shem Ham Faresh, God's ineffable name. This mystical name he wrote on a little piece of parchment and placed it in the earthen golem's forehead. Little did he dream what a monster the creature would turn out to be when he beheld its frightful aspect and its destructive tendencies, he began to repent his folly in making it. His golem could very well destroy the whole world. So he drew forth the Shem Hamferish from its forehead, and immediately the monster turned to dust. It would be interesting to investigate what Mary Shelley knew of this legend when she wrote her Frankenstein children. In 1625, the eminent Italian Jewish doctor, scientist, and encyclopedic scholar Joseph del Medigo, while journeying through Germany, Poland, and Lithuania, observed that many golem legends of this sort are current, particularly in Germany. The legend of the golem of Chelm was undoubtedly one of those he heard. The golem of Prague, the most popular of all the Jewish golem stories, is without doubt merely a latter-day variation of the older tales. How it happened to fix on the historical personality of Rab Rabbi Yehuda <clears throat> Lowy will always remain a fruitful source of speculation for the folklorist and the historian of Jewish culture. It is sufficient that it has been and still is one of the most alive 
as well as one of the liveliest <clears throat> among all Jewish folk legends. This fact is not without its historical or national cultural interest. The image of the golem, as it was already fully developed in the 16th century golem of Chelm, was that of a Frankenstein with frightful propensities for tearing up and smiting down. It remained for the latter legend of the golem, golem of Prague to endow the terrifying figure with moral and social grandeur. The crude, shapeless lump of clay no longer was a figure symbolic of the genius of indiscriminate destruction. The golem <coughs> in the hands of the Marsh Merharal of Prague became a national protector of the persecuted Jews, a godsend avenger of the wrongs done a helpless people. It is precisely this aspect of the folk imagination and the historical forces that simulated it that are of the most universal interest, for it is well known folk legends are not just accidental in their origin and fanciful fictions invented by the childlike masses. They are a true record and mirror <clears throat> of the complicated historical and cultural experiences of a people. The middle of the 17th century was a cataclysmic period for the Jewish people of Europe. It marked the most dreadful massacre of Jews in history, of course, excepting those by the Nazis in World War II. The terrible ravages of the Thirty Years' War and the revolt of the Cossacks under Bogdan Jemilinski against Polish rule left the Jews of Europe frightfully decimated and shattered. This was immediately followed by the Masonic fevers which tortured and racked the spirits of those Jews who survived the bloody Holocaust and finally left them spent and disenchanted. Darkness and superstition descended on the Jewish ghetto as it never had before. Nowhere could Jews themselves cope with the problems of their survival. God, it seemed to them, had abandoned them to the sword and the persecution of the enemy without, and to the seduction and betrayal of the Masonic swindlers within, such as the Messiah of Smyrna, Sabati Zevi. <clears throat> so in its despair, the folk mind, fed by sickly, cabalistic dreams and myths current at the time, created the myst magical figure of the golem to protect the Jews' puny weakness with its enormous physical strength, to discover by means of his supernatural powers <coughs> the plotters against their peace and thus fool their wicked plans. It was the golem as redeemer that viewed within the historical frame of reference of the tormented Jewish life in the 17th century in Europe lends the legend such, such haunting poignancy. In period A period. <coughs> it seems like those wicked spirits are trying to choke me. But I suggest you go and find more information on this. Because I can barely find but very little. And the Kabbalists. The Kabbalah is wrong from what I've heard. And they insinuate it. But no, none of the Jews really talk about it. So, yeah, I suggest you go do that, and I do think it's those corporations that are the golems, but they're doing something very wrong to hurt God's people. So that's a wicked act. Well, wherever you are, day or night, have a really nice one. Later.